next video. Okay, uh, let's see. This is exam two material, and so, yes, puppy. Um, and so, uh, I assume that uh, you have already watched the video on uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the first new one for exam two. The last one for exam one would have been the Davidson Capital Market, which I'm going to kind of review here again. But, but where that left off, the Davidson Capital Market one was that the way Davidson had it set up, the economy was going to come to something that's very unrealistic, and that is a uh, stationary state. That at some point, firms were going to invest to the point where they've got uh, as much uh, physical capital as they wanted, they're just going to stop. So, you know, either the economy had shrunk down and kept on going like this, or it had risen and kept on going like that. One way or the other, stationary state. Now, we all know that doesn't make sense. That in reality, there is a business cycle. And the very first time I, I taught this class with that book, um, I thought that, I know he doesn't believe that. That doesn't make sense. And so I tried to figure out how can I adjust this in the context of all the other post-Keynesian stuff to make sense of it. And I then come up with this. Uh, actually, it's a, um, a paper that I published, uh, but this is a presentation I did on it. And the reason I want to do it on the PowerPoint is uh, you'll be able to see the graphs so much more clearly. They're going to be right on top of each other. Um, if somebody wants this PowerPoint, email me. I never remember to give these things out because I always, I never think of the PowerPoints as being very useful. But if you want it, sure, absolutely. Uh, do let me know and I'll, and I'll email it to the whole class. So, what I'm about to do, well, I'll show you. Uh, hang on, dog. All right, that, this is uh, me setting up the paper. This is actually the presentation I actually did. So this is me setting up the paper. Uh, let's see here. And then the business cycle. Okay, now you're familiar with this. And it's putting the, 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 the labor market, I'm sorry, the capital market diagram and the business cycle back into the context of the uh, ZD diagram. This is straight from Paul Davidson's book where he developed that model. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just copied what he had there. So where we want to be, where we want to be is right here, of course, at full employment. However, uh, whenever the curve shifts down for whatever reason, that's going to leave us short of full employment. And of course, as you and I know, the reason for it to shift down is for a fall in investment, which is what we're about to, to get to here. Okay, so here's the Davidson Capital Market. I know you've already done this uh, on the last exam, but let's go back over it again. That's not a terrible thing, is it? Uh, and here, first of all, the demand for capital. As you may recall, D sub K is the quantity of capital demanded, so that's how many new factories or restaurants or whatever uh, that firms want. P sub K is the cost of a factory or a restaurant. That's how much it costs to build it. So that's going to enter in negatively. The higher the cost, then the less likely that, or, or the, the lower quantity of restaurants and factories that firms will want to purchase or build. I is a rate of discount. It's a little bit like the interest rate, um, but, but he describes it this way. That, that uh, how much people discount future earnings. Um, that if I said to you, uh, do you want $5 a day or $5 a week from now, you're going to say, today, because uh, I'd rather have it right now. If I said, do you want $5 today or $100 a week from now, you'd say, I want the $100 a week from now. Somewhere in there, you're going to get to where you're like, ooh, I don't know. That's kind of tough. $5 a day or $5.57 a week from now, I don't know. And that's when we've determined the rate at which you discount future money. To you, $5.57 a week from now is the equivalent of $5 a day. Well, the, the higher the rate at which you discount future earnings, the less likely you are to build a factory. Because you're like, I want the money now. I, I, I want to be able to spend this income now. I don't want to build a factory and then earn income slowly over time. I, future income means nothing to me. That would be like if I said, do you want $5 a day or $100 for a week from now? And you said, oh, $5 today. Because that, that would be an incredibly high rate of discount of future income. So the higher the rate of discount of future income, the less likely you are to invest. It's not going to end up being a big, important variable here anyway, uh, because really it's going to be sort of the inverse of this right here, which is the expected growth in the, and this is the way Davidson works it, the expected growth in the demand for the products produced by the capital in question. In other words, if you're building a new restaurant, this is 
how much you expect people in the future to want to go to your restaurant. All right, well, what's the demand for restaurant food in the future? If you're building a shoe factory, then that is what do I expect the demand, uh, and it's expected, demand uh, in the future for shoes to be like. All right, so uh, it's whatever your factory is going to make. What's the demand for that? Because you don't want to sell the factory, you want to sell the stuff the factory's making. And then last, and this is unusual uh, that he bothered to include this because most, most models don't, he said, well, we're also going to get financing. All right, and this is going to end up being the next topic we cover in great detail is going to be finance sec financial sector. He said, just because you've got this great idea, that means nothing. Until you are able to convince somebody to loan you the money, it ain't happening. So your ability to receive financing is also going to be a factor here. So the higher the price of the restaurant, the less likely you are to build it. The greater your rate of discount, the less likely you are to build it. Uh, the more you think people are going to want to go to restaurants, the more likely you are to build it. And the more able you are to get financing, the more likely you are to build it. All right, so there, there was the demand. Now... There's the demand curve, right? We've got, uh, do I have that in the next slide? No. Um, notice here we have the price on the vertical axis, which means the slope of the line is being determined by that price right there. As price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. All three of these are still on there, but they're going to cause shifts. And in fact, that's exactly what's going to happen when we get a little further into this, is the important thing is going to be the shifts that take place in this demand curve are going to cause the business cycle. All right. So there is uh, the higher the price of a unit of capital, the higher the price of building a restaurant, the smaller the quantity of restaurants entrepreneurs want to build. This is the existing number of restaurants right now. Case of one is the existing stock of capital, the existing number of restaurants, right? Then, see that? Isn't that awesome? Watch. Magic. Bling. There's the demand curve on top. And that gives you what Davidson calls the spot price uh, or the uh, demand price. He also calls it the demand price of, of uh, uh, capital. Now, I got to tell you, when I was first reading this book, Davidson is very much a follower of Keynes, and Keynes was a follower of Marshall. And Marshall, Marshall tended to talk in terms of supply price and demand, demand price rather than quantity demanded and uh, quantity supplied. Uh, let's say we've got a situation, shucks, I, I wish I had my, my board over here. Um, let me drop for you real quick. Let's just shift the camera over here. Sorry, doggy. Let's shift the camera back to this for a moment. That's a... Uh, yeah, that's all our laundry there. I'm in charge of doing the laundry. Melanie is in charge of folding. Uh, so, <laughs> won't she be excited when she gets home? All right, let me turn this camera. This is around here. Okay, uh, this is what I'm talking about here. Oh, I already put the pens away too because I wasn't planning on using this. I didn't think about it. But check this out. I, I want to talk to you about the uh, supply price and the demand price. And the, my point here is it took me a while to figure out why in the heck Davidson was talking about because um, this is not the way we talk nowadays uh, in, in economics, but it makes perfect sense and boy does it work better for what he's setting out to do. So we have a simple supply and demand diagram. But we're not in equilibrium, all right? We're, let's say we're not in equilibrium. Um, then, let's see here. What we usually do is this. When we talk about a situation that's not equilibrium, we say, oh, look, at that price, the quantity, what are we going to do? The quantity uh, demanded is less than the quantity supplied. As you can see here, the quantity demanded, of course, comes off the demand curve, and the quantity supplied comes off the supply curve. At P sub zero, that's not equilibrium. I'm trying to stay in front of that little uh, glare there. At, at P sub zero, that's not equilibrium because the quantity demanded is less than the quantity supplied, so the price will fall, right? This is the way Alfred Marshall talked, and Alfred Marshall basically invented microeconomics, um, and so... It's not like it's just some joker walked, done wandered in off the street and started talking about stuff. He thought this way. He thought in terms of supply price and demand price. It's the same sort of thing, but, but check this out. 
All right. He says, aha, that quantity is not an equilibrium quantity because the supply price is P sub zero, but the demand price is P sub one. The price that firms would have to be uh, able to get for uh, make them willing to produce P sub, uh, Q sub zero. Let me say that again, sorry. The, the price that firms would have to receive to make them willing to produce Q sub zero is P sub zero. But for the uh, consumers to be willing to purchase Q sub zero, the price got to be P sub one. So this is the demand price. And that's the supply price. The price that suppliers would have to be able to get in order to make them willing to produce that quantity versus the price that consumers would have to be able to uh, pay in order for them to be willing to consume that quantity. We're going to be talking this way, all right, uh, in terms of supply price and demand price, and it really works for what we're about to do over there on the TV screen. Because uh, what we're going to end up with is a situation where entre, oh crap, entrepreneurs, sorry, four years of French, um, they're going to they're going to have their demand price, All right? But then we'll call it construction industry or whatever. We're going to have a supply price. This is the price that the entrepreneurs are willing to pay for the restaurant. This is the price they actually have to pay to get a restaurant built. Aha! Whenever this exceeds this, investment boom. My gosh, it only cost me a million dollars to build the restaurant. Heck, I would have paid two million, all right? So I'm going to build a restaurant. Uh, whereas when this is higher than this, we have a glut. That the amount it costs to buy, or, or I'm sorry, the amount, the amount it costs to build a new restaurant is three million dollars. Heck, I wouldn't pay a million for it. So we have too many restaurants and the economy will shrink as firms don't invest. So we're going to be talking over here in terms of supply price and demand price. Demand price is the price that entrepreneurs are willing to pay. Supply price is the price they actually have to pay the producers of capital in order to get those producers to actually make the uh, capital in the quantity that they want. And it's a really, as I said, it took me a while to get used to it because I was raised with this method over here, uh, and I knew about this, but I hadn't thought about it in years. Uh, and so once I got used to it, though, uh, I really actually preferred this, at least in this context, at least in the context of talking about investment. So what we've got so far is this is the demand price. It is what, oh, I got my camera right in front of my monitor so I can't see what I'm pointing at. Uh, this is the price that entrepreneurs are willing to pay for a new unit of capital. Here is the existing supply. Here is the demand curve which is derived from those right there. All right. Once we had taken these factors into consideration, it told us that the demand curve should be right there. All right. So, what this is saying is that these entrepreneurs are looking out at this sea of restaurants and they're saying, boy, uh, if I could buy one of those restaurants, I'd be willing to pay P sub S, all right? And now the question is going to be, what do they actually have to pay? Now, not only are these budding entrepreneurs able to purchase an existing restaurant, they can build a new one, right? You can either buy an existing one, buy somebody out, uh, or buy a share of stock, which is buying a share in that, in that industry, uh, or they can build a brand new restaurant. And that's what this curve is right here. This is the building of brand new restaurants, okay? Uh, that, of course, we start at K sub 1 because we've already got that many, so we're adding to them. And it's upwardly sloped because we're operating on the assumption that the busier the construction industry is, the uh, higher the prices are going to be of construction. 
you know, way back in here, oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, PM. PM is the least they would accept. This is the cheapest you can possibly make a restaurant for, all right? Uh, or a factory or whatever we're talking about here. And so it's not gonna be, it's not gonna come out of the origin. I mean, there's not gonna be, oh, I can build a restaurant for zero. No, there, there's some minimum price. Again, it's very abstract. We can't really say the price of a unit of capital, can we? Because there's so many different kinds of units of capital. But sticking with the restaurant example, this is the cheapest we could build a restaurant, uh, some generic restaurant. And then the busier the construction companies are building new restaurants, which is what this will be over here. There'll be shortages in supplies. There'll be shortages of workers. Uh, they'll be less inclined to give you a good price. When you, when you call them in and they, they write up their plans and so forth, and they don't have to be real competitive with their bid when they know you don't have a lot of choices. So the busier the construction industry is, the higher the price of a new unit of capital goes, because you can see the price going up and up. And by the way, the lowercase s sub k is the new construction. The uppercase s sub k is what's already built. And notice it goes vertical here. Theoretically, there's only so many restaurants we can build, right? Give Given our current amount of supplies and construction equipment and, and skilled workers, there's only so many we can build in a given time period, so it goes vertical at some point. Okay. Now, so there's two supply curves, right? There's the supply curve for where we are right now, that's how many exist, and then here's adding new restaurants over here. There's also two demand curves. Here's the demand curve that we already talked about. But you have to bear in mind, oh, and I'm sorry, look, I got a little bit off on my second curve there. You can see it moved just a tad there. Uh, my apologies. But um, this second curve with the lowercase d is merely for replacing worn out capital. Not only does TCU build brand new uh, performance halls, they also go in and repair the dorms and uh, rep replace the computers. All right, I get a new computer every four or five years because, you know, obviously it gets out of date. And TCU is not increasing their capital. They're trying to keep it in the same place. They're trying to replace something that, 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 that is out of date. So, uh, or when an air conditioner breaks and we have to go replace that. We're not adding new capital. We're just replacing the existing capital. Capital wears out. The gap there is just to replace worn out capital. And as you'll see, sometimes we won't bother to replace it all. Sometimes we'll let stuff wear out. You know what? That air conditioner broke down and we ain't got the money. We're just going to shut that dorm down for a while. All right. So um, we don't think that, that, that it's worth the uh, money. Now let's put it all together. Current stock of capital. Entrepreneurial valuation of a single unit of the existing stock of capital. In other words, what they're willing to pay for an existing stock of capital, and there's that equation again, there is the possibility of building new capital. And here is that second demand curve, which now we have the total demand curve. This, in, this initial demand curve here was just thinking about, okay, sort of a static sense of if I could buy an existing restaurant right now. Wait a minute, but not only might I buy an existing restaurant or, or, or build a new one, I got to repair my old ones, all right? My old restaurants I have to have things need to be replaced. So that's what that gap is right there. So now this is the total supply, existing plus new potential. And this is the total demand, the demand for the sort of basic demand for, for capital and then also including replacing worn out capital. Voila, there's the cost to produce. This is how busy construction companies actually will be. And notice the construction company doesn't draw a distinction between whether or not they're building a new building or, re or repairing an old one. It doesn't make any difference to them. The cost is the cost. So, to, uh, so these, this lowercase d also adds, <clears throat> pardon me, to how busy the construction company is. Here's what the entrepreneurs were willing to pay at P sub S. That was his spot price and his flow price. I don't know why he called it that. I, I like, uh, he also said this, that's the demand price. This is the supply price. This is the price at which they can actually buy it. That's what they're willing to pay. That's what they have to pay. That's what the construction companies are telling them. Uh, yeah, if you want this much activity, this is the price. And notice that what they're willing to pay is above what they have to pay. Yes, they're excited. So what we get is a total amount of new investment this gap here, K sub 1 to K sub 3. Uh, that is, you remember we were at K sub 1, and then the total amount of investment for this time period is K sub 1 to K sub 3. But, so, so that's how busy construction companies are. In terms of the vertical intercept of the ZD diagram, 
If we abstract away from the government and trade and have just investment, that's how big the vertical intercept is. That was investment this time period. Now, something that the ZD diagram doesn't care about is how much of that investment was to build a new restaurant and how much of it was to repair an old one. But in this graph, we do care. This much was net. This much was brand new. This much was replacement. How do I know that? Because it's the gap between the two curves. I already said that's what that was. The gap between the two curves is just stuff that wore out. So of that total, let me even, well, nah, that's good. No, hang on, let me have a look here and see. If I can zoom in a little bit more even. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a lot better. All right. Now that it's getting a little uh, tight in here, let me zoom in. You won't see me as much, but perhaps that's a blessing. Uh, so here is just replacement. So if this was gross investment, all investment activity added together, and this is replacement investment, this must be net. This much was the addition of brand new restaurants. All right. This was just to keep the old restaurants going. This was brand new restaurants. And so... What that means is the next time period, that's what I love about this graph, it's dynamic. It is showing something, it's a snapshot with the implication of, yeah, but it's not going to stay like this, all right? You draw a supply and demand diagram, there's no reason to believe it's ever going to move, right? Uh, but with this, you're saying that, okay, I, I know where it is right now, but, but glancing at that, I can see, aha, next time period, the supply curve will be there. Let me do that again. Next time period, the entire supply curve, S sub K, is going to shift right and, of course, pull this S sub K S plus S sub K along with it. And that's what I do right here. Watch what's going to happen. K sub 2 is suddenly going to become the new current stock of capital. All right? But then what happens next? Well, this red line here becomes the new current stock of capital. And I think that's all I do right there. Yeah. Um, so what we have here is that over time, when we start with PS above PF, we're going to slowly start, <clears throat> pardon me, shifting right, uh, however the amount of net investment was, the amount of net investment was. Uh, oh, I need to show you something else. I got it on a piece of paper over there, though. Uh, but anyway, so, so there's the situation that you have when you start with PS above PF, all right? And it's just going to keep shifting right. And, and there's something else important to conclude about that in just a moment. But I just thought of something else I wanted to show you. Let me grab my notes here. Because something I haven't shown you is, what's the situation when PF is above PS? And I have that right here. When, in other words, oh, here it is. Uh, in other words, what happens when how much you have to pay is actually greater than what you're willing to pay? When how much you have to pay is greater than what you're willing to pay as an entrepreneur considering the construction of physical capital. I'm afraid I don't have this on a graph, but I've got it right there. Uh, look at that one right there. What you can see is, you can see that in this situation, PF, which is always going to be the intersection of the SKSK, DK, DK, all right? It's going to be the far right one because that's what's actually going to be going on this time period. PS or the demand price is kind of in your head, all right? It's not written down somewhere. Uh, it is what you would be willing to pay. PF is written down on a sheet of paper. That's what the, that's what the construction company told you it's going to cost that, all right? So PF is a real-world number. PS is also a real-world number in a sense, but, but it's in your head, okay? Uh, and so when the price you have to pay is greater than what you're willing to pay, Look at the gap between DK plus DK, uh, uh, I'm sorry, look at the gap between DK and DK plus DK. Notice that it's bigger than the gap from K1 to K3. In other words, firms aren't going to bother to even replace all the old capital. In fact, the economy is going to shrink, or uh, I shouldn't say that way. The stock of capital is going to shrink. It's going to go from K sub 1 to K sub 2. We're actually going to have negative net investment. Now, we still have positive gross investment. Positive gross investment was K1 to K3. That's how much investment there was. But K1 to K3 was insufficient to replace all of the worn out capital. To replace all of the worn out capital, we would have had to have replaced K2 to K3. We only replaced 
a portion of that. Why? Because entrepreneurs didn't think that whatever this industry is, you know, maybe people, are st well, like right now, people stopped going out, we're still in the middle of COVID right now when I'm videoing this, um, people aren't going out to eat. So not only am I not going to build a new restaurant, I'm letting old restaurants shut down. So the total quantity of restaurants is going to go from K1 in this time period and shrink back to K2 in the previous time period. And uh, there, if you want to take a screenshot or whatever, or, or, or uh, pause the video and, and jot that down, that there shows you all the relevant uh, values for uh, on the graph. So you have a reference of that. And since I showed you that, I might as well show you the one for where the stock of capital is. Here it is. The situation I just showed you on the uh, PowerPoint. There's the one where uh, not only do we replace, you know, investment's going to be K1 to K3. That's total investment. That not only took care of replacing the worn out capital, which was K2 to K3, but it also added some capital, K1 to K2. So we had positive net investment. And why did this happen? Because what entrepreneurs were willing to pay was P sub S, but what they had to pay was P sub F. So they were willing to build new capital. And if you want to jot all that down right there, you can. Okay, back to the video. Alex, you need to come downstairs? Okay. I didn't know if she wanted to. She's in witness protection, so she doesn't like to be videoed. Um, all right, so one way or the other. And that, that was all exam one stuff. In fact, I think I'm going to put this video and, and uh, shift it over to, uh, towards exam one as well, which you will already know because I will have already done it. But what all that implies... Uh, here I am making fun of ISLM curves, but you don't get that. What all that implies is that if we start like this, as I did on the uh, PowerPoint just now, and have the total stock of capital continue shifting right, K1 to K2, or here, let me back up and show it again. Notice what's happening here. I don't know if you can see it or not, and, and I will show it in a minute with another graph, but net investment is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the gap between PS and PF is getting smaller and smaller. We're working towards this point. We're working towards the point that entrepreneurs have built as many restaurants as they want. Right? They've built as many as they want, and all they're doing from now on is simply replacement, nothing else. They've got as many restaurants as they want, and they're only doing replacement investment now. This is a stationary state. Right? So this happens regardless of whether we start with PS above PF or PF above PS. It eventually stops right here. 